for worse, the idea was to bring the <laughs> to bring together the worlds of um, policy and practice, and so that's what we attempt to do in our events and our publications uh, here at the center. Um, the Global Health Initiative itself was founded a couple of years ago with the goal of bringing together uh, all of the different programs and projects here at the center who are involved in health in one way or another, but we also uh, focus on three specific areas within global health, uh, maternal health, health in post-conflict and post-disaster settings, and health financing. Um, for today's discussion, we're fortunate to have three experts with us. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Rebka Amsalu, who will uh, address the impact of conflict on reproductive health systems and the risk for women. Next, we'll hear from Theresa McGinn from RAIS, who will discuss how their initiative is utilizing data and experiences from active conflict zones to inform program delivery. And then we'll finally hear from Meriwether Beatty uh, from JSI, who will offer uh, recommendations on how policymakers can improve access to reproductive health services for women. Um, outside, there are longer bios available, so I'll just be very brief um, <coughs> in introducing our speakers. Uh, Rebka Amsalu is the Emergency Health Advisor for Save the Children. She provides guidance and technical assistance to Save the Children's Global Reproductive Health Programs in Crisis Initiative and is the technical advisor on acute and chronic emergencies in their global programs. Uh, previously, she worked as medical coordinator for MSF uh, in several Asian and African countries. Next, we'll hear from Teresa McGinn, who is the Associate Professor of Clinical Population and Family Health at Columbia University's Mailman uh, School of Public Health. She is uh, the director of the RAISE Initiative, which stands for Reproductive Health Access Information and Services and Emergencies. Uh, in the past decade, she served as deputy director of the Averting Maternal Death and Disability Program and was the principal investigator of the m and &E Program um, for the Reproductive Health Response in Conflict Consortium. And finally, Meriwether Beatty is the Reproductive Health for Refugees Project Director at JSI. Um, she's worked on reproductive health uh, for refugee issues for more than 12 years and has worked also on the Family Planning Service Expansion and Technical Support Project, SEATS, and on the USAID uh, <coughs> Deliver Project. So that's enough for me. Um, I'm gonna turn over the floor uh, here to Ripka. Uh, one final note is that uh, you see a camera there in the back. We are uh, webcasting this event. Uh, it'll be up online in about a week, along with links to the uh, PowerPoints and, um, and other materials of interest uh, for this program. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. Yep. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for, for inviting us. And being able to talk about reproductive health in crisis settings is, is always um, a pressing issue. And, and we thank the Wilson Center for, for inviting us away. <coughs> Just to start with, over the last 20 years, the profile of uh, communities affected by conflict has changed. Um, we are seeing more internally displaced people than we are seeing refugees that have crossed the international border. And as you can see from this graph from the uh, IDMC uh, profile uh, over the last years, uh, the number of internally displaced people has gone to 26 million globally, and the refugees uh, more than uh, 11 million uh, globally. In addition to displacement due to conflict, we are also seeing an increased incidence of natural disasters. And over the years, as you can see, uh, the graph is, is growing exponentially. This is a figure from um, the IMDAT, the Crisis in Epidemiology Center. You can see the figure <coughs> also from their website. Last year alone, there were more than 400 natural disasters that resulted in displacement and, and crisis in globally. So merely even just adding these two figures, globally at the moment there are more than 35 million displaced communities and communities affected by natural disasters and conflict, which is really a massive figure. Um, conflict negatively affects the health of women generally. 
the massive dislocation of the population, they become more vulnerable to environmental issues, more vulnerable to violence. They live with very few assets, so impacting their livelihood. The social networks are disrupted. Uh, this, is, this is a picture from Afghanistan. Uh, communities are so isolated, and even in the areas where they go as displaced, they are socially and politically marginalized. And as you can see from this picture from Pakistan following the earthquake back in 2005, healthcare infrastructures are also affected severely. Either they are destroyed during, during the earthquake, which is the picture from Pakistan where the health center was completely destroyed. Health personnel are either displaced or even part of the crisis. Their family, they lose their family, they lose their well-being as well. And access to the referral services is, is severely limited. There is high mortality associated with any crisis situation. <coughs> and as humanitarian communities, when we respond to this crisis situation, uh, as Save the Children or any other agency, there is multiple competing needs. There is a need for shelter, there is a need for water, for sanitation, for food. And even within the health sector, there is a competing need. Um, there is a need for communicable disease control systems, there is a need to manage casualties due to conflict, in addition to addressing the reproductive health needs. And again, just, just to capture some of the key figures, uh, over 26 million displaced people, significant majority of them are in Sub-Saharan Africa, nearly 50 percent. And even if you just look at the figure for 2008, newly displaced in, in countries, more than 25 countries had new displacement due to acute or ongoing conflicts. In addition to that, the often neglected chronic or protracted emergencies. The IDMC estimates there are 35 countries where there are displaced people living in camps for, for, for a prolonged period of time. The main countries that have the highest number of displaced people, gr greater than 50%, are Sudan, Colombia, Iraq, DRC, and Somalia. From their figure, they show that, uh, and we know that sexual violence is the most underreported um, incident, if you like. And even from their data, they show that 18 countries documented that women and children have been exposed to violence. <coughs> sexual violence and gender-based violence. Uh, this is a figure from the Lancet Countdown uh, series on maternal, newborn, and child survival. And as you can see, seven of the 13 low-ranked countries with maternal mortality are countries that are affected by conflict and instability. If you look at figures from Sierra Leone, Afghanistan, Niger, Chad, Somalia, DRC, and DRC, yeah, Congo. You see the highest maternal mortality and the lowest ranking. Um, and even within these countries where there, is conf uh, where there is a high maternal mortality, there are pockets where there are displacements and where there are people affected by crisis that show really worse reproductive health indicators. In a study with IRC, International Refugee Committee, they documented that maternal mortality was really highest uh, in Eastern Congo as compared to Western Congo. So even within those countries where there is a high maternal mortality, the, the areas that are affected by crisis have the poorest um, reproductive health indicator. Again, abortion rates really high in Northern <coughs> Uganda where there are displaced communities for over 10 years over there. Increased the level of gender-based violence. So what, ha what has happened over the last 20 years um, since ICPD uh, declaration for reproductive health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being? The first report on the needs of women uh, displaced by conflict was reported by the Women's Commission, where they did an overview of the needs and a massive gap in terms of response and addressing those uh, reproductive health needs. Uh, following that, the minimum initial service package was developed and is currently part of the sphere minimum standard for humanitarian response. The cause of maternal mortality don't change, whether it's in a crisis setting or non-crisis setting. 
And the interventions that we promote are the same. There are similar interventions that have been documented to be effective, uh, even in crisis setting. That's, that's what we promote. The way we do it, however, is different. In the initial phase of a crisis, we promote the minimum initial service package, which is really the basic thing that we can do to save lives and prevent days uh, among women. And gradually, uh, we promote the introduction of a comprehensive reproductive health package. The figure shows it's, it's a bit linear here, but in fact, reality, it's not linear at all. Uh, countries go in and out of crisis. Um, the minimum initial uh, the minimum initial service package for reproductive health includes five main objectives, preventing maternal and newborn mortality, through uh, provision of clean delivery kits and making sure that there is access to emergency obstetrics uh, care 24-7, preventing uh, and, and managing the consequences of sexual violence, preventing HIV AIDS, mainly really uh, making sure that there is condom available and, and safe blood transfusion is there and there is a standard precaution. Uh, and then uh, looking into uh, forward for a comprehensive reproductive health service. We do promote that that should begin really early on in a crisis setting. And uh, as part of the comprehensive package, which we all encourage to be begin uh, immediately, we, we have uh, the maternal newborn health, family <coughs> planning, uh, treatment of STI, um, HIV AIDS, and gender-based violence. This is just to show you an example of Save the Children response back in 2008 following the cyclone in Myanmar in Burma. Uh, we had already a, a long-term development program looking at healthcare needs of, of people, um, and then uh, the cyclone Nargis happened in May 2008. Uh, and, and we had community health volunteers who were going to women houses where they were identifying visibly pregnant women, giving them a package of clean delivery kits, showing them where they can go for emergency obstetric care. Uh, this is a picture from, from uh, Pakistan, again, really emphasizing the need to have women medical professionals as, as early on as possible, especially in settings where, where there is a strict uh, conservative um, religious restrictions. And then again, really promoting any method of doing referrals, whether it's a water boat system or donkey or, or, or whatever you have, really, <laughs> to ensure that there is access for emergency of service care. Uh, this is this is a figure from our program in, in Sudan um, showing that really over the two years you can achieve success uh, even though there are many challenges be it security, logistics or funding. It is doable uh, and evidence-based interventions can be implemented in crisis setting and you can achieve some success uh, in, in, in increasing facility delivery and, and skilled attendance. The challenges remain, um, sustaining commitment among uh, donors, humanitarian workers to make sure that the minimum material service package is implemented at the very beginning of any crisis, and that is followed through with a comprehensive package. Uh, there is a still a challenge for that. The sphere is being reviewed now. So the RH team are, are promoting to ensure that comprehensive RH is, is part of the sphere uh, manual. And just to look at as well conflict as an opportunity. And majority of these countries <coughs> where we work are countries that have really the lowest RH indicator without crisis. So using this uh, the uh, occurrence of, uh, of um, emergencies to promote more comprehensive reproductive health service. And, and looking into sustainability factors, which is, which is a challenge uh, for majority of us who work in any emergency setting. Uh, and Mary Weather will give us some good examples on that line. <laughs> um, there is good opportunity to do operational researches, um, even just even testing whether we can use community health workers to do family planning service at community level, or training mid-level professionals like nurses, midwives to provide emergency obstetrics care. So there are opportunities that we need to exploit in documenting better, better service. Um, these are resources. There are many resources on reproductive health that you can go to. Um, thank you.
Thank you, Ripka, and thank you all for coming. Um, it is very much a pleasure to be here, and I, I, get the, I get the email. I live in New York. I, I'm at Columbia University, and I get the emails all the time from the Wilson Center and say, gee, if I lived in Washington, I'd go to this. <laughs> and then I don't, because I live in New York. Um, and I also love the notion of, of the, Wilson, the Wilson Center mandate to link policy and practice. I think that that is the driving idea, really, behind what the RAISE initiative is trying to do, and I think what a lot of us try to do sort of in our everyday work. Um, that's, I guess, the holy grail, perhaps, of, of this, is, is bringing the, the, what we know, the intellectual rigor and the experiences that we have, the evidence that we have, and making it real for the women on the ground. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the RAISE initiative, what we do, where we are, who we are, um, and then I'd like to talk, the, the topic I've been asked to address is, is using data, and so I'm going to sort of zero in on that a bit. It's, it's one piece of many things we try to do uh, with our partners in the RAISE initiative, um, but to sort of use it as an example of how we can promote the big picture of what we're trying to accomplish using, using data. Um, it's, it raises a joint initiative of Columbia University, the Melman School of Public Health, and Mari Stopes International, based in London. Um, and what we, what we intend to, what we aim to do is to address the, as, as Rivka suggested, the full range of reproductive health needs in active conflict sites and as, since we're, we're a five-year program, four-and-a-half-year program, post-conflict because times change and it is a very mobile and very um, dynamic process and so we're doing that as well. And, and our, our main sort of um, arms of what we do is to strengthen institutions integration. Just as Ripka said, there's tremendous competing needs, but we want to work with agencies to, so that reproductive health is as a standard of service as they go into an emergency as water and sanitation, as food, and have reproductive health be part of that core package of things. Improve service delivery on the ground. That is ultimately what it's about, is to give women and men the right, their, their rights. They, they have a human right to health services and reproductive health services specifically, so we aim for that. And, and part of that, to be able to accomplish those ends, is really to influence global decision making, policies and funding decisions. Money being quite an important something I don't have to tell you people in Washington. <laughs> um, the, we are very much a partnership, and Save the Children and uh, Jon Snow are members of it, along with these other members, um, and working in all different ways in, in the headquarters pieces, on the ground, and again in that policy arena. As Ripka mentioned, we do want to address the full, the comprehensive reproductive health, and so those, those focuses are emergency obstetric care, both comprehensive and basic, including post-abortion care, family planning, and it's so wonderful to, to sort of see a resurgence in that in the development world and the relief world because I think many of us would uh, agree that it's been a little bit on the back burner for a while. Um, and also reproductive tract, in, tract infections, HIV prevention, and gender-based violence. We focus on the medical response and referral, um, which again tends to be a, a, a more unserved area of that in the world, in the relief world. Um, what has to happen on the ground does differ um, by, by the areas in conflict. Um, so Congo is in a different situation than Colombia, though both have among the highest numbers of displaced in the world. Um, and what, so what is needed is different, and what we, so what, where we can contribute and where we can work with our partners is different. Um, but we are trying to attain a standard of good reproductive health care in each of these places using different mm, programs to, to get there. Um, so where we are, are in, uh, we're in Colombia uh, on the Thai Burma border with the Maytow Clinic um, on the Thai side. In Darfur, uh, with these partners, Northern Uganda and DRC, and DR I'll talk a little bit, a little bit about DRC. Um, so reproductive health in Congo, again, war or no war, reproductive health is a problem in Congo. It was a problem before the war. It's a problem during the war and after the war. And the country actually is both. It's it's current conflict. It's post. You could argue it's post conflict, sort of in the West. Um, so it's, I don't know if it's post-conflict or not, but we're, we treat it sort of as both in trying to address all of the different needs of active crisis and post-conflict as well. Um, with, again, among the worst situations in the world um, that, 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 are, that I think, again, I hope we agree, need attention. Um, and what we find in, in again, conflict and post-conflict is there are weak the health systems are weak. Again, they were weak before. The war has certainly uh, weakened them further. 
these tend, the, the, the pattern in the world isn't, you know, six month conflicts and then everything's back to normal. They go on forever, for decades, quite literally. And so during that time, very little development happens in reproductive health, in health or in other sectors. Um, so there's clinical, there's certainly cl weaknesses in clinical systems, there's absolute weaknesses in community systems. Challenged even further by, as Ripka mentioned, the, 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 the breakdowns in community networks that are so critical for good community health programs. Um, and then massive policy and funding gaps and competing needs for those. And more specifically, when, when a service is new, either because it's been ignored for a while or never existed in the first place, it's, it's new. There's no thing there to, to build on. So there's, there's going to be a lack of skilled staff in, the, in and certainly what we find through, our, through the data we have collected. You can say, what's your policy on mid-level providers? There isn't any policy on mid-level providers. And so there's nothing to sort of, you have to start from a position of, from the start of, of discussing these issues, which do need to be discussed. Um, again, lack of experience and all of, all of those systems all of the systems in a Ministry of Health or in an NGO have to be developed if this isn't what they've done before. Um, logistics and fundraising and supervision and training and monitoring and evaluation. And so again, th these are some of the things that we do try to address with our partners in the RAISE program. Um, and so, and again, now going specifically to data, to the piece of all of those things, and just to kind of focus in on one specific area. Um, we're working with the partners on the ground, and again, at headquarters on the ground, and also in this global policy arena, we're trying to create or enhance, in many instances, the use of evidence to improve program management. So sort of, again, kind of quite standard development practice to do this. Um, and the sense that while there may be different NGOs assisting government, that there is a role, f especially in post-conflict, for government to sort of have some system, some standard system, so to trying to promote that part of, of the development piece as well. And then again, so certainly a strong focus of, of our data work is on the ground for immediate improvement in, in program management and service delivery. But since we are a global initiative with so many partners, with all different strengths um, and what everyone can bring to the table, we're also trying to look at that evidence from a multi-country and, and, and from different perspectives to try to see what does it mean for the field in general? What does it mean within the RAISE initiative and what does it mean even broader than that? And specifically to use it for advocacy, to, to, to bring the evidence to policymakers, decision makers, people who make decisions about the money to say, let's not forget these folks. And, and, that, and what we're arguing for there is that traditionally development professionals have sort of left the refugees out of things because other groups take care of those. And the, re the refugee professionals, the relief professionals, leave reproductive health out because it's not a standard part of their package. So this is the specific issue of reproductive health in crisis sort of gets left, left off everyone's agendas. And that's what we're trying to sort of finagle it back into the different agendas. Um, so the idea is that better evidence from the field will improve program management. And so as a baseline, one way we've done that is done some might say too extensive <laughs> baselines, quite extensive data collection, which is its own set of challenges in these sites, rather nightmarish, and I hope worth it because we've been able to collect quite good data on, on facilities, what actually does exist in the facilities. And it's, it's not nothing, actually. People, it's incredible what people struggle through and, and are able to do and deliver. You go to you know, a, a clinic in rural, rural, back of beyond Congo, and they're delivering babies. They're doing C-sections on that mat I showed you by nurses because they have to. That's, women are dying and they do what they have to. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable, but it should be improved and they, they need help to do it. Um, we also do population-based surveys. Um, it's the kind of standard uh, knowledge attitude practice surveys using CDC. Again, we're trying to use lots of tools that are, ex that are already in existence from the reproductive health world, from the development world. Um, We've done baseline, the, the partner agencies themselves have done their own internal baselines to see where they are on their own policy uh, decisions and statements and, and, and um, status. And also a, a baseline on global policy and funding tra trends. And actually in June, a, a, a very good paper is coming out in PLOS, the online journal on global funding trends in RH for, uh, in crisis. Um, 
In addition to the baseline work, which will, of course, be repeated at the end of the project to see changes, where there's also an incredi a very intensive effort on ongoing data collection and, again, trying to systematize that within the different countries, within the different partner agencies um, to make it, again, useful for programs. And so trying to, a lot of times, of course, that, re that requires changing the existing data collection systems such as they are and trying to abstract the data that you do need for reproductive health to be able to make those decisions. And then we have a, um, we've developed a, a base, uh, a database online that can, that again tries to, that collates the data from the different field sites. Um, and so the idea is if you can use information, kind of collect it, systematize it, have it be meaningful, and, and to be able to be used in a meaningful way, you can actually do that and, and decide where you're going and are you where you mean to be and where you can be um, and, and know whether you are or not using information. And so again, the whole point of all of this is to use the information, not to just collect it. And so there's, quite, again, quite an intensive collaboration and activity on the ground in each site, in each facility, in each district office. Um, in places where we're in multiple sites like Congo, um, d bringing that up to the region, bringing it to the national level of using that information for specific, for everyday decisions. Are you doing what you think you should be doing and what you've planned to achieve? Are you achieving it? What do you have to do to change that, to achieve it, to get closer to achieving it? Nationally, we're in multiple sites in Sudan, in Congo, um, actually in the other, in, in Colombia, in Natal Clinic. Um, and so again, identifying the policies, thing, bringing questions like who can do what, that per question of who, what service providers are allowed to do specific interventions is a key one in every country in the world. And we're linking in with this human resources um, investigation that's going on with so many agencies. And, and again, bringing that learning into the relief world as well in countries like Congo. There, there's a lot of decisions to make and let's inform it as, as best as we can, as well as we can, to be able to make, to have the, the Ministry of Health and the government be able to make the decisions that are right for Congo, and we, our job is to inform that. And then again, with uh, globally, um, to bring the decision, the, the information, the evidence to the decision makers globally. Um, I mean, ultimately, particularly post-conflict, conflict, conflict, countries still in active conflict are somewhat different. We still work with local authorities, but certainly post-conflict countries have national governments and our job is to support them. Their job is to do the work. Is they're responsible, they're accountable for delivering health services and, and, and specifically in our involvement, reproductive health services to their people. And our job really is to provide the, techni the technical expertise, the support, the guidance, the, the collaboration to do that um, for the services themselves and then on the policy, on the policy pieces to, to help them to, to, um, not go through the same sort of trial and error perhaps that many countries have gone through and to kind of be able to use evidence to get to decisions and policy policies that they can, that'll help them move faster through the, through the development that they have to do. And ultimately what we're after is this, is women singing and dancing. Um, healthy women, healthy children um, to, through good reproductive health services so they're attaining their rights and their health. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Can you hear me? Okay. I tend to shout, but if I back up, if you, if you can't hear me at any point, just raise your hand. And if I start speaking too quickly, that's another tendency to like try to get as much in as possible. Sort of like flag me down at some point. Um, I, I'm starting. I'm focusing on this picture. It's a it's a picture of a local organization in Pakistan called Frontier Primary Healthcare. And they started actually serving Afghan refugees many, many years ago and soon expanded to serving the local Pakistani community as well. And they're based in Mardan, which has actually been in the news a lot because it's where the IDPs are coming to in the current crisis. And this is the theme of the presentation, actually. It's sort of local partnership and capacity building. And I read an article recently that was actually from a long time ago, but it had a term that I really liked uh, about how we needed, it was talking about the relief to development continuum. And it said we need to take a more developmental approach to relief. And by that, it sort of, it, it talked about four points, strengthening local institutions, 
improving sort of human resources, sort of um, strengthening human resource, improving infrastructure, and the productive capacity of the local community. And I thought that really, s that sort of gets it, it where I'm going with this and looking at recovery, because I think it's really the key to recovery and reproductive health in recovery is that it's starting in the very beginning. It's sort of that from the immediate stage. It's not all of a sudden looking at it in post-conflict, but it's really how we address it from the very beginning of a crisis. <coughs> so this is sort of the, the simplistic traditional linear model that I think a lot of you are familiar with. I mean, they're the stereotypes, but I put them up because I think it's often what people still think of. If you hear emergency, you think perhaps Red Cross, MSF is there right away, sort of that active um, stage of a crisis where the relief organizations are there, people are dying, um, sort of that, that dramatic, the front page of the newspaper, which, which then is, is over pretty quickly. Ideally, in this stage, as Rivka talked about, you would be providing the MIST, the minimum initial service package, and really from day one of the emergency. It's not something that waits. You know, it's a set of, of, of priority activities that, as Rivka talked about, saves lives right from, from the beginning. But then as the situation stabilizes, you move into comprehensive reproductive health care. So then, in theory, you know, UNHCR is there coordinating, and you move into different activities. I mean, this is a picture of community, male community health workers. They're Afghan refugees, and it's health education. So it's sort of that stabilized setting because, again, as both Teresa and Ripka have talked about, these situations are protracted. And I think the, um, the current sort of that average length of displacement is either between 17 and 19 years. So then you have a transition period and then moving into post-conflict and development where you actually have policy development, system strengthening or building. And ideally, that would happen sort of in the transition, that this is happening earlier on, moving into development. But in reality, you have this transition gap. So it's something that people are talking about a lot for years and years, but certainly in the past year, you know, hearing a lot about it, a lot of workshops. And so thinking about what we mean by transition gap, and this, I think, gets at it in a visual way. This was an assessment that the Basics Project did in Liberia, documenting sort of all the health facilities, um, service delivery points throughout the country. And the green dots are NGO-supported health facilities. And so it, talk, it, it looks at as funding, as sort of the relief funding dries up and the relief organizations pull out they then become red dots. So these health facilities just get left. And so just, this is just sort of keeps looking into the future, more and more red dots appear. So then coming to December 2008, we're pretty much the whole country is full of red dots. And they had, I think, in the, in the earlier slide in 2006, the, um, 77% of the health facilities were supported by international NGOs. And then if the funding pulled out as it was supposed to, it was going to leave only 11% funded by NGOs, and the rest actually having to be covered by the ministry. So then, of, you know, what are the consequences? And again, these are, these are obvious. There's nothing sort of new about this. But the service disruption, higher out-of-pocket costs for health care, reduced access, decreased utilization of services, rising morbidity and mortality, and increased instability. So exactly what you don't, you don't want to happen. So then focusing on the reproductive health part of this transition period, and this is, um, there was a survey conducted, a population-based survey done in Lofa County that CDC, actually Basha was here and sort of lived and breathed that survey for a long time. Um, but it was looking at, at reproductive health indicators in this transition period. And the hypothesis was that the, the reproductive health situation, the indicators, could be as bad as during the emergency. And in fact, that is what the survey documented. Um, but it, it wasn't actually just a survey. It was actually an interesting pilot um, looking at sort of an innovative model for addressing some of the reproductive health gaps that happen in the transition period. So it, ha it was a research to action circle um, that involved local partners. 
and really involving them from the very beginning. So with the data collection, sort of local partners were identified, and then it was using the findings from the survey to guide program design, but actually with the Liberian NGOs. So again, why, why local NGOs? I mean, why, why weren't we working with sort of the international relief organizations that are there? And again, this is obvious, and I feel like you know, these bullets could go on and on forever, but it, they cut you off on PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, just, it's obvious that local NGOs are, are there. They're within the communities. They're often working in places that are hard to reach, where the infrastructure is so bad that international organizations aren't. I mean, one in particular is in a part of Liberia where there are no international NGOs. Um, they complement other health services. It provides these linkages, both with the government and international agencies, the potential for sustainability and continuity of services. And then sort of coming back to the obvious of the, the first picture of the, the organization in Pakistan, they're aware of the sensitivities. They know what the community wants and needs, what the issues are around reproductive health. And I think this is very specific to reproductive health. I mean, thinking about some of the communities and the comprehensive package of reproductive health. And w within this continuity and range, what, what is the demand? What are the issues? What are the sensitivities around this? And that local NGOs are often the best suited to provide these. And then also, this is, this is highlighting Teresa's point, that with all of these challenges, and there are a lot of them, there's also a great potential. And looking at Liberia and sort of this earlier, where the dots you know, the, the red dots fill up, that that actually didn't happen. That the, the Liberian government has a clear vision and that this is an opportunity. I mean, in some ways it's sort of starting with a blank slate, essentially, and that they've developed very strong policy related to reproductive health and different components, not just maternal care, but really looking at it broadly. Um, and again, with the partnership and capacity, capacity building, that they're not sort of saying, we want to do it all on our own, but let's work together, but very much guided by the government. And of course, I mean, the, the leadership plays a big role of this. And, you know, this is again, I know you're not supposed to do this on a PowerPoint, throw as many words as possible, but I didn't know how to cut this because I think it's, I just think it's articulated so well, and I'm just going to read it. It's stated by President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf for capacity building. To be truly sustainable, it must be indigenous, building on the experience of all Liberians and encouraged by their own social conditions as well as their dreams and desires. We understand that the issue of sustainability is paramount, as is the need for support and assistance from our donors and partners. We all share the goal of developing our internal capacities so li Liberia will thrive with diminishing dependence on outside support. And it's, I mean, that sums it up of, of what we want to happen everywhere. So then moving on to, into sort of another example, and again, Ripka talked about this. I mean, it's not actually linear. I mean, that's sort of a, a very simplistic version. But in fact, there's a lot of this all happening at the same time. And as Teresa said, you, you don't know where things are. Is it conflict? Is it post-conflict? There are different things happening around the country. There are different actors and players involved. And I just, I like the visual of this because I think it shows that there's a lot of this stuff that's going on at the same time. And again, you might have sort of spikes in emergencies and sort of this acute phase and then stabilized. It's not just this acute emergency stabilized moving on. It's very much sort of a roller coaster <coughs> and a fluid situation. And then that brings me to Haiti and sort of a, a very hard to define situation in country. I mean, wait, sort of. <laughs> You know, I, I'm, I'm struggling with like, how, what category do you put it in? And these quotes are from a recent reproductive health assessment. Every day is a crisis. That's from actually someone within the, the Ministry of Health in Haiti. And that everything in reproductive health is a gap. And that's actually from a, someone from a Haitian NGO. And I think it gets at the mindset that it is, even though theoretically it's stabilized, um, perhaps a fragile state, but not active conflict, that the, the mindset is still of crisis and sort of the natural disasters and this vicious cycle that happens. Um, and also coming back to the MISP, and you know, the MISP is minimum initial service package, but in Haiti, 
even the MISP is not, or sort of the components of the MISP are not found throughout the country. You know, sort of the, those basic minimum requirements for reproductive health are not accessible. Oh, can you, can you Todd, just learn this animation feature? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I used a lot in this. Okay, so you do. You have you have the vertical programming. So you have the Ministry of Health. You have a very vibrant and active Haitian NGO community. Then you have the natural disasters happening. You have political instability. You have the international relief organizations, and you have the development organizations. So you have a very small country and a lot of people there, and very vertical vertical programming. So then this, to me, again, sort of gets at, gets at the crux. I mean, we're, we want this perfect balance between the short-term immediate needs. As Teresa said, you don't want to leave the person lying on the street. You know, you need services for that. But then also thinking about long-term sustainable development and trying to find this balance. And I think in Haiti, the weight has been more on short-term relief. And if anything, it sort of contributed to a very vicious cycle that international NGOs are there and are providing some of what's the only comprehensive integrated reproductive health. But they're in very small parts of the country, so not many people have access. And then it's undermining the development that's going on. They're sort of the dependent on the relief and that it's taking away from the development and the capacity building that's occurring. And that the Ministry of Health and the Haitian NGOs sort of working with them rather than bypassing them and building their capacity then makes them more able to respond, you know, to the next hurricane that comes. So then, again, this is just emphasizing. I mean, they, they, the situations change. They're, they're, they're complicated. IRC talked about recently that 90% of their work is actually not camp-based, not acute emergency. It's protracted, cri um, protracted crisis and post-conflict. And with the development organizations, more and more are coming in earlier in sort of fragile states post-conflict. And so in theory, you have a really nice overlap, overlapping period where ideally there's a lot of communication and a handoff. But in reality, and again, I'm doing animation again here, <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way. I mean, you have different mandates, both within the relief organizations and the development, as well as the donors. Poor communication, they're not actually talking to each other necessarily. Competition because now all of a sudden the, you know, there's this limited pot of funding, you have even more organizations there trying to get the money, and different funding cycles. And again, relief organizations working on short term and development sort of longer term funding. So this brings me then to Pakistan and sort of the, the current crisis that's happening there right now, because again, it's, you know, you've got a lot of different actors on the ground. You've had Afghan refugees who have been there for decades. You've had an earthquake in the past few, five, um, past few years. You have the relief organizations that have served both the Afghan refugees and responded to the earthquake. You also have a lot of development organizations and development funding. And this sort of comes back to, to this argument about a developmental approach to relief. This is looking at a, a development project there and sort of the, the two things are building the capacity of the existing health system and fostering a community-based approach to ensure a con cont con 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 continuum of care for mothers and newborns. And the, the reason that I'm bringing this project into it is because their target areas are actually where the active conflict is. Um, so it's where the fighting is going on and they've pulled out for security reasons. But now, I mean, their, their other target group is Mardan and the surrounding areas where the IDPs are coming. And so then looking at, at what their objectives are in the project and what they're already doing, it sort of makes sense actually to work with them thinking about some of these components of the MISP rather than just ignore the development community, bring in the relief organizations to provide those services and sort of shift paradigms, put development on hold that actually working in partnership and doing it together, like the Liberia example, is the way to go. And if you can start that from the beginning, you have the potential for sort of more of a balance on this weighted shift. So again, this, this just emphasize, emphasizes the local partnership. And, and Teresa's point of 
you know, wherever you go, there are people doing things and working. It's not as if there's nothing. I mean, there people can talk till they're blue in the face about human resource issues and there's no capacity, yada, yada, yada. But in fact, there are people there providing service, doing things. It doesn't mean they don't need support. It doesn't mean they don't need funding, um, technical support, the organizational development <coughs> strengthening. But they actually do have the capacity and to sort of work in partnership rather than ignore it for that sort of traditional relief model. I think this also gets to the, the coordination issue. You know, you have all of these, you know, you've, you've got the relief groups and the relief funders and you have the development groups and the development funders and sort of getting everyone at the same table shouldn't be so hard. But as you know, I mean, you're in the same building, a lot of you, and, and how hard it is even within the same building to actually communicate and talk to each other. So coming back to this perfect balance, I think Pakistan actually represents the potential for finding this balance and starting earlier in the process for partnership and the sort of the developmental approach to relief where groups are working together and it's not an either or. You, you can provide the services but still be working with, with local partners and building the capacity and trying to strengthen the systems at the same time. So then sort of finishing, you know, I, I'm talking about this balance and, and what will it take? And I, I talked about that article that I read that was so old. And again, it's from you know, like 15 years ago. So we've been talking about this for a really long time. And I, I do think that donors, that a lot of this has to be donor driven. I think donors really need to, to take charge of this. I mean, I think the relief community certainly is aware and wants to. They're, they're in these post-conflict settings and they see what's happening. And I think the development community as well are in situations where they want to move faster and sort of want to offer what they have. But I think it's, it's the donors coming together and making it happen. Um, the, I talked about the flexibility of the donor mechanisms and mandates. And some of this um, has to do with, with the data and looking at monitoring and evaluation and what donors require. And I think they're, especially in the relief world, you need, you need quick results. But as a colleague said, like you want good results. You don't, I mean, quick results are one thing, but what ultimately you want are good results. And so it's really shifting this mindset and of getting away from this pressure for sort of the immediate, immediate reaction and response. And again, thinking about a situation where the, you know, you're displaced for 17 years. And so if you're, you're thinking about a funding cycle that's six months or a year, and giving lip service to capacity building, but how much, cap how much capacity can be built in a six month period? And really sort of shifting away from this. And then just coming back to this need for earlier and more sustained partnerships, starting right from the beginning and, and then feeding in so that you actually can avoid some of that transition gap and have a stronger recovery period. So thank you. Okay, thank you all three of you for excellent uh, presentations. Um, I'd like to start the Q&A session. As I, as I said earlier, we are uh, taping this, so please wait for one of my colleagues to come around uh, with a microphone and let us know who you are before you ask your question. Uh, start up here. Hi, I have a question for um, Teresa McGinn. Um, I'm Kimberly Rogan from Population Action International, um, and I'm working on um, a project that's with <coughs> HIV, but it's kind of based off the safe motherhood module and what works. And um, so a, one study we found showed that in providing emergency obstetric care in refugee camps in host countries um, actually improved the health in for the entire population. And I was wondering, we couldn't find anything really about HIV that kind of similar to that study, and I was wondering if you had any suggestions for resources or similar studies that using HIV. So the idea that improving c kind of one service had other ramifications, other right? So improving other HIV care for specific refugees, specific to conflict, right? Go ahead. 
I'm just wondering if maybe the UNHCR survey yeah. that they did on HIV AIDS uh, probably has that yeah. documented. I'm looking at yeah. Russia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah. Oh, great! Thank you so much. And it's and I think that that idea that that, that again is in development and also in relief. You know, part of the challenge of these sort of, you know, it's an HIV project or it's a safe motherhood project. I think what's been documented numerous times, and again in development, and, and I, it applies to relief, is that when you improve a system, whether you care or not, the system is then usable by other services. And I think HIV programs are finding that dramatically. I mean, you know, it, again, it can be HIV money and people and staff, whatever, who go in and improve labs and, and infection prevention and, and all kinds of systems in hospitals, but then, it's, then you have infection prevention in the hospital for everything. And so I think that the principle is absolutely true, and I think, you know, finding it documented in different places is really true. And I, and that's where, again, that you know, the kind of that the, the vertical money question, you know, vertical versus integrated programs. Again, it's not so simple or 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 obvious. There's all kinds of overlaps that I think we have to exploit. We have to understand and and use to our advantage. So I hope you find it, and I hope you use it for those purposes. Uh, in the back there, Kara. Um, my question is for Teresa McGinn. I can't see you, I'm sorry. <laughs> my name is Kara Honzak. I'm, I work at the World Wildlife Fund with a population health and environment project, and we have just uh, about a year ago started a new project in, in and around the Salonga National Park in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So I was really interested in hearing how in these sort of transitional post-conflict settings, especially where you have different pockets of conflict affecting people in different ways, we're in a very remote area that is indirectly affected by the conflict throughout the country, um, and they don't even have a lot of the basic, of course, uh, services under the you know, MISP model. I'm curious how you, s if you could give us some specific examples of how data that you've used in some of these post-conflict settings, maybe particularly in the DRC, has been used to transform policy at the local, um, provincial, or national level, because we think that's one of our um, strategic advantages as an environmental NGO in helping to bring this data to the fore, but we haven't been terribly successful, I would say, with some of the scale up in, in these conflict type settings. So if you could give us some examples, I think that would be great. Um, in, in DRC, um, we, we worked there with International Rescue Committee and CARE, and they did, so a, an example is they did these facility assessments, which are kind of horrifyingly long questionnaires or sort of uh, guides as you, as you, uh, you walk through a facility and see what's there. It, it actually goes, it, it's not as horrifying to do as it <laughs> looks because it's, it's, it's so detailed and since a lot, of the a lot of the commodities and equipment don't exist, it actually goes quite quickly. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry about if it works if it's not there kind of thing. So, um, so, so those were done in 19, 19 hospitals and another whole set of health centers in uh, six provinces in Congo. And, so, and those results, and, and as we found in, in, in the Averting Maternal Death and Disability Program, I think when these facility assessments have been done, it's again not a surprise that there's some, some things work and many things don't. Um, so it looks at things like, is, is there power? Is there water? Are there people? Wh when have they last been trained? Are there drugs? Are there commodities? Are there equipment? Does it work? And, and kind of to a one, when those data are presented, again, because it's very systematic, it's clear, it's quantified, um, when they're presented at a district or provincial level, it's shocking. It shocks people because people know it's bad and there's problems, but it, it's, it's kind of in your face. And I think, a, and so those discussions, and again, and, and it's, not, it's not particular to Congo at all, but when those discussions have happened, it, it provokes action. It provokes sort of worry and, and, and decision. And so, and that, that has happened in, in Congo. And we've also they've then had national, kind of national workshops on the data as well because it would not be at all surprising that those same similar findings would also be in other provinces that weren't part of this sample of this of this work, um, and so and and again, it, it's not a 
it's not, you know, data are presented and then everything's solved by any means. Um, it, it's another input to the discussion. Um, you say, you know, staff really are an issue. Well, let's, let's then address the question of who can do what and what do we do about, you know, there's, there may be nurses, but they're not permitted by regulation to do, you know, manual, manual removal of placenta, for example. So let's see about that and let's look at experience from other countries and build that in. So it's, it's a way to have the dialogue. Um, solving it is the same problems there are. I mean, it needs, it needs programs, it needs money, it needs Ministry of Health guidance, it needs, it needs outside support at this point. I mean, that, that is the reality in a place like Congo and where you're working. Um, so, so, I mean, so, you know, it, you can look at these data and, uh, you know, none of it comes as much of a surprise, quite honestly. It's not, you know, you do the survey and say, oh my God, we had no idea this was even a situation. But it does quantify it, systematize it, and legitimate it, really, to, to and allows those discussions. Um, and so, and, and again, you know, leading to policy discussion and then policy change. Um, but, but local authorities also have to be able to focus on that, which is tougher in places with active conflict like where you are. Um, so again, I, I guess it's not a, it's certainly not a kind of a one-two punch where it's just obvious and clear and then it gets fixed. It's, it's a discussion still. Um, but it certainly clarifies the needs and the importance of it, because people, it, it's, it, the data are there and, and you, you, there's no, you can't refute it, it's there. And people agree that it needs to be fixed. And that, again, is a step in the process of fixing it. Okay, all the way up here in the front, uh, Suzanne. <coughs> Gonna stand up so I can see Meriwether. Um, I'm Suzanne Petroni with the Summit Foundation and about a decade ago or so I uh, worked with Teresa Merriweather among others um, when I was at the State Department doing reproductive health and refugee situations. So good to see you <laughs> again. Um, I have kind of a big picture question for you which is having been in this field for a dozen years or so or since the, the mid 90s and seeing the development of it, can you give us some reflections on how you've seen these issues prioritized or not uh, among policymakers, UN agencies, donor governments, and in country governments, the trends that you've seen. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually really, that's a tough one because I think in the early years and sort of you were involved in that, there, were, there was such concrete, tangible change every time you went to the field. I mean, I think about Pakistan and frontier primary health care where you couldn't say reproductive health out loud to w where you weren't just saying it out loud, they were doing adolescent RH and, you know, talking about you know, sort of gender awareness to sort of get at GBV. Um, so there, there was definitely a, a, I'd say a lull, um, a, a lull. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I, a lull to is to, is putting it nicely. I mean, I think there was really a long period where it was hard, and there was a big focus. I mean, there still has been movement and still progress and a lot of good things, especially related to gender-based violence and HIV programming. But thinking about the comprehensive package as a whole. I think it's, to me, sort of some of the, the frustrations and the failures are thinking about the MISP and that we're in 2009 and the MISP is not automatic. It's something that, you know, at this point still sort of trying to find out who in Pakistan is implementing the MISP is really hard to do. You know, the, so, so people are talking about it and, oh, yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's stuff happening, but no one can actually say this organization's coordinating or, or this. Um, is happening, and then and then the different components that have gotten dropped off. I mean, family planning. You mentioned this that it's coming back, but but for many years, I mean, really, y you couldn't find a contraceptive in a lot of a lot of places. So, um, I think it, it was a, a really strong start, and and optimistic that it that it's going to happen again. But I think thinking about it from that comprehensive way. I'm usually the cynical one, but I'll, I'll, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sound so optimistic. Um, I think, I, actually, I fully agree. I mean, I think, you know, that it was, 
the, the 90s were so exciting because there was such, it was just so in your face that nothing had ever been done and so much happened quickly and that was very, very exciting. And then the, yeah, the 2000s, the early 2000s, there was a, you know, Lull is putting it gently. Um, and it, you know, and coincided with, with uh, budget shortfalls and, and, you know, markets and all of this. Um, and then, and I think there's been a bit of a resurgence and I think we're kind of an area that's, that has shifted kind of fundamentally from those very early days is that I think it's now kind of understood and clear and, and, and kind of obvious to all and people are working on the fact that when we started, it really was, we focused on refugees and camps. And I think it's, it's a sea change. I mean, I think people really now understand that it's not that. Th those folks are there. Refugees in camps are still there and they need attention. And they get it better than anyone else, which is not to say they get it well. But I think, uh, you know, internally displaced in non-camp settings in really fragile states are on the agenda. And I think that's part of the reason why it's very frustrating that more hasn't happened. I think if we had limited our focus to refugees in camps, we'd actually be sort of happy maybe, you know, a lot happens, more happens in those places. But we've expanded the view tremendously and, and you know, uh, it's very, it's, it's the job is so much harder um, with those, with IDPs um, and there's so much more to do and it's, and again, and it's with IDPs also, you can't, it's not just international NGOs coming in and doing the work. It has to be in partnership, even in the act of conflict, with local authorities. And so, so it's much harder. And so it is very frustrating. And, and I, I guess I, I, lately I am optimistic, I think. Again, the change of administration certainly helps in this country. But European countries have taken up much, some of the slack that has been, you know, that hasn't happened, the leadership that hasn't happened here. So there's been sort of promising pieces, but but difficult. I, I mean, I, I think that does hold. I think it's been tough and uh, better in the last couple of years. And, and I, again, I hope, I mean, maybe better in the next few years, especially here. Okay, I guess just pass the microphone right back there. Thanks. Um, thanks, Melissa Scher from American Refugee Committee. Thanks to all three of you guys for excellent presentations and a really broad spectrum of what's going on and what the needs are. I think. Just to build on the last question, to build on what you guys are talking about, the thing that we've noticed is that this, this displaced and how our businesses has changed and, and how we can look for the instance of rays of using the data that we're collecting and working with the ministries to actually share that data and, and how that effort is going or the plans for that. And I, you know, I kind of know, but it's, it's the hard one. And also with Meriwether's about like working with the local NGOs and how that's a piece, but then how that complements the Ministry of Health actions, especially in like Pakistan where you do have a relatively strong and Ministry of Health um, with relatively strong services compared to some other countries that um, like the DRC, for instance. Um, so I just wondered about how um, that has evolved, like working with that, that tr untraditional partner in crisis centers and how you're going to use the data to share that with the ministries. <laughs> and we're struggling with the same stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I think basically raise hopes that you guys do it. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, you know, it is, you know, American Refugee Committee is one of the partners, and I think, uh, you know, on the ground, yes, I mean, you know, there's, we, we can, there's resources at the different headquarters, you you know, at the headquarters of the agencies in the field and within raise the, you know, at, at Columbia University at Mari Stopes. Um, and I, I, you know, I think I think that does have to be a concerted effort. We have 18 months left in Rays, um, and and I think I think we do. I think we have to kind of work very hard. But you know, ag again, the leadership on the ground, you know, it, 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 you would have to lead that. I mean, I think the partner, the agencies on the ground, again, with your local partners who are ministry, often local NGOs as well, um, to do that, and and we'll help. <laughs> <laughs> And then right behind you there, Brian. Uh, hi, Stephen Dahl. I've been assessing mobile phone-based medical systems. I was uh, just going to ask, probably uh, Therese, are you working with any technology partners for data collection, surveillance, GIS, things like that? Um, we, we, th this is very exciting. And we, we thought about it and thought about it. And we're going to try it in Thailand on the, on the Thai-Burma border. 
Um, we kind of got scared off in Congo and Darfur and South Sudan, and we didn't do it on our baselines. And, and Thailand's on a little, our, our Maytow Clinic project's on a little bit of a different schedule, and so, um, so we looked into it, and we're and we're we're kind of going to try it. I, 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 yeah, we've had cold feet, and there's no good reason for that, really. I mean, we mm. should have, could have been. It, it was just so. It was just. It was so hard <laughs> doing the data. And again, I, you know, I still agree, <laughs> you know, with with some trepidation that the effort we put into data collection is really important because it, it serves all of these needs. But it was a tremendous, tremendous challenge to the field. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, doing population-based surveys in Darfur, in northern Uganda, in insecure areas, in, you know, <laughs> God help us. It was, it was really very difficult. And, and so, and, and I th it was sort of one more thing that, it could have made it easier, I think, but the unfamiliarity, it's sort of the standard, you know, response to why people don't do smart things. It's, it's harder to do in the beginning, even though ultimately it'd be easier. So. I have I have sort of visions for our final surveys, you know, and final base um, end line work that we could do some of this because I, I do think it's the wave of the future and um, and I, I'd love to see more of it actually. Mm. And we're, we've had aspirations again. I I'm not sure exactly where we are on the Thailand piece, but I know we were further along there than we were in other sites. Mm. And I, in a way, I mean, I wish we had it when we did the population based survey in Save the Children, yeah. and we use this now. I mean, last year we did lots of PDS uh, personal data for data collection and and data entry, and it, it makes life so much easier for for in in every stage of the process. And I wish we had we had that. Um, yeah. Let's say two years back. <laughs> Uh, yeah, right there. Um, hi, I'm uh, Neeraj Mistry. I'm uh, an independent consultant in global health. Um, I used to work a lot with the business community um, at the Global Business Coalition on AIDS, TB, and malaria. Um, and, and while there was a clearly a humanitarian need for providing antiretrovirals, we had to make the economic case for why corporations should be involved in this. Um, and I was just sort of thinking about that in this context where if we looked at um, or has there been work done on um, economic um, returns on this sort of intervention, uh, looking at cost effectiveness and cost benefit and even perhaps cost utility analysis to say, well, if we provide these services, here's what our return on investment is. Even if they will application of what, you know, these elements or components of a project might be, if you have any, because we're, we're thinking of working in the DRC and we're trying to bring some new models or test some models, and I wondered what kind of ideas you have actually at the field level about how, how um, that's happening or not happening. Well, I, I, I can speak for, for Save the Children, I mean, I would say, um, in several settings, at working with the Ministry of Health and, and making sure that even the services that they have at, at the remotest places uh, with the lower skilled personnel are, are equipped, are trained, is, is a good way of working um, rather than just creating a parallel system. And that has worked very well, both in, in terms of emergency of such care, in family planning and STI treatments. Um, in Uganda recently, uh, um, several children with FHI published this paper on using community health workers to provide injectable contraceptives. Mm -hmm. So, and and th that had shown very effective way of increasing access to family planning supplies, and that's published and available. So you can you can ad adapt that and and training nurses and midwives and doing MVAs or or, or manual removal of plasma that has been tested and works. So really using lower or middle level health professionals building their skills to deliver these effective interventions can work. That's what I can say. Yeah? Yeah. That's great. Great, thank you. Okay, well I think think we're run out of questions and we're um, so we'll wrap things up here, but I wanna thank again uh, our presenters. Please join me. <laughs> And thank you all for coming and, and for your good questions as well. And please, uh, please stay on your email and look for uh, further notices of uh, future maternal health events here at the Wilson Center. Thanks.